good morning. Happy to see you survive the spring break. Not everyone did. I hope you had a restful, relaxing time. You were able to recharge. Today, I'm going to review with you the main concepts and ideas within two chapters of the Prince, chapters six and seven. Those are two key chapters, especially chapter seven. They're key to the understanding of the whole Machiavellian system. If there is time at the end of this introduction, I will continue with my presentation of the ideas and suggestions for the paper. I will continue with that presentation about the paper on Wednesday until it's done. If there is time on Wednesday, I will introduce our next Machiavellian text, which is Benigna Machiavelli, 19th century novella by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. On Friday, we will continue and complete our view and analysis of the talented Mr. Ripley. So, as I said, in order to proceed more quickly, I will summarize the contents of the chapters, read very few passages from them, and just let you use these concepts as guide for your understanding of those chapters. So chapter six is focusing on leadership. And it includes a famous list of classical leaders, leaders of antiquity, leaders that have been celebrated inside the Greco-Roman tradition and also inside the Judeo-Christian tradition. People such as Cyrus, Romulus, the founder of Rome, Moses from the Old Testament. What is that Machiavelli has to say about leadership? It is important to consider once again that everything that Machiavelli discusses is placed within his system of ideas and therefore we're not surprised to find here heavy reliance on the concept of context. Leadership, like anything else that Machiavelli discusses inside The Prince, is not associated with universal values or standards. That is to say, a leader cannot be defined outside of a social and historical context. And therefore, the qualities that make a leader successful are entirely dependent on the positive, successful interaction between the skills that nature supplied to that particular individual who's trying to become and be a leader and the issues that need to be solved within a particular context. Machiavelli discusses this by using the language, the terminology of his own time and culture. Terms that had become very popular during the time of humanism and the Renaissance, and terms that the Renaissance had in turn, in turn borrowed from classical culture. You know that <coughs> Renaissance, rinascita, means rebirth. And it is based on the assumption that what is being reborn during the period that goes from the late 1300s to the late or mid 1500s is the best ideas of the classical times, of the times 
of the ancient Romans and Greeks. And so the terms used by Machiavelli are virtue and fortune. Both are terms that you find quite often in the culture of the Greeks and the Romans, for the Greeks culture was arete, but it was the same kind of idea. That is to say, virtue in this context is not abstract, is not the sum of moral or ethical qualities. Virtue is the ability of an individual at any level, <clears throat> at any level in society. My voice is not used anymore to, to speak in as much as I did before the break. It is not, it, it is the ability of an individual at any level in society to make a change, <clears throat> to control their lives, okay? So it is a very pragmatic quality or set of skill. And fortune, fortuna for the Romans, is the circumstances that any individual finds in his own context, in their own context, which cannot be controlled by that individual, right? Such as the time you were born, where you were born, to what family and therefore to what social level you were born, and the all important addition emphasized by Machiavelli, the qualities that nature endowed you with, the talents that nature gave you. <clears throat> we know from previous lectures, <clears throat> I already mentioned how Machiavelli and the culture of the Renaissance in general works on the basis of the conviction that only certain individuals, only a small number of individuals in any time or any community has exceptional skills, right? So leadership is not something that anyone can uh, aspire to. At the same time, you have to keep in mind also that exceptional qualities, extraordinary talents, are not sufficient to turn an individual into a leader or a successful member of society. Because once again, it all depends on the context. The context will determine what issues need to be addressed. And this emphasis on issues is typical of Machiavelli and it is not surprising to us because Machiavelli himself was influenced by the circumstances of his life, by the fact that he, as a man who grew up in Florence at the end of the 15th century and died in 1527, was worried about the political and military crisis that affected his own city-state and Italy in general, right? He lived through a series of wars that, in fact, only came to an end more than 20 years after his death in 1559. And the conclusion of those wars was, in fact, that Italy lost its independence and the Italian states fell directly under the authority or indirectly under the influence of foreign powers, so much so that Italy will be able to restart the process of national unification only in 1861. 1861 is when, March 1861 in fact, is when Italy, uh, the, the, the first kingdom of Italy was inaugurated in the new Italian parliament, and it only included about 60% of the Italian peninsula, not even the whole of it. And the process continued 
until 1918, until the end of the First World War. Okay? So Machiavelli emphasizes the fact that leadership is determined by what critical issues exist in society more than by positive goals. And those critical issues create a demand for certain skills. And of course, the, the, the underlying reliance on the logic of supply and demand tells you also who the author of this book is. That is to say, someone like Machiavelli who grew up in a commercial city-state that relied on a mercantile economy that was really at the cutting edge of capitalism during that period. Don't, don't forget that uh, I mentioned previously how the florin, the golden coin used by Florence, was almost like the dollar nowadays. It, it was a currency that was used internationally throughout Europe that uh, had that level of confidence by uh, people not just in Florence but in Italy and outside of Italy. Okay, so nature gives everyone certain skills and nature according to Machiavelli gives a select few extraordinary skills. However, there are then two farther obstacles to be overcome in order to become successful. One is, of course, you have to train yourself and develop the skills that nature has given you, because otherwise you don't realize your potential and that you can control, that you can do yourself as an individual. That is your choice. That is the result of your commitment, right? But then there is fortune. Fortune is everything you can control. What is that leader cannot control? The kind of skills that nature has given any individual in a given society during a given time, even when developed fully, may either be in demand or not and therefore they will be wasted. In order to become a successful leader, you need to have the skills that are in demand inside the context where you operate. This context, of course, is not a fixed context. It is an ecosystem. Therefore, it is the result of a sum of processes, right? There are things going on outside of a community that will influence what is in demand. There are forces and players operating within that context that will determine what is in demand. That is to say, there is this additional corollary that even when you are provided by nature with the skills that are in demand in a context and you develop them fully and you're able to express those skills something that certainly happened to Cesare Borgia throughout a significant portion of his life, and that is why Cesare Borgia is uh, designated by Machiavelli as the best example of an almost perfect leader. Even when you have those skills that are in demand, you are within a context that is fluid that works like an ecosystem and therefore at some point that context may change what is required to succeed. And if that change is significant enough, then the skills that you have as an individual will not match the nature of the critical issues that need to be addressed and therefore at that point you will fail. And this is essential to understand why chapter 7 begins with Machiavelli saying Cesare Borgia is perfect and ends by saying, well, therefore Cesare Borgia failed and uh, he, he was unsuccessful and, uh, and these are his errors. 
So, is he perfect? Is he not perfect? Did Machiavelli had too much Chianti to drink the night that he wrote the conclusion of chapter seven? Of course not. You have to keep chapter six in mind in order to understand chapter seven. And although the prince may look like kind of random, right? A very creative package for the ideas of Machiavelli, very different from the systematic treatises that were written about politics uh, throughout the Middle Ages and at the beginning of humanism, there is a logical sequence. Chapter six establishes the premise, the intellectual premise that allows you to understand the apparent contradiction that you find between the start of chapter seven, Cesare Borgia is the perfect example that I can propose to you or readers and the conclusion of chapter seven that says Cesare Borgia was responsible for his own um, failure or at least partially responsible for his own failure. In fact, the failure of Cesare Borgia has to do with this dynamic. Cesare Borgia had the right set of skills for the start of his political career, but lacked the particular diplomatic skills that were needed for him to go through the crisis that he encountered at the time of his father's death, his father being Pope Alexander VI, and therefore someone who uh, uh, endowed Cesare Borgia, his son, with a network of political and international connections that were vital to the survival of uh, Cesare Borgia's new state and uh, the continuation of his political and military campaigns. Okay? So, Cesare Borgia is perfect, but Cesare Borgia at the same time could not escape his faith, or maybe he could have, and it's very significant that exactly at that point in the chapter, exactly before the final paragraphs where Machiavelli explains how Cesare Borgia failed, Machiavelli inserts himself as a character. And that's when, talking about the period when Cesare Borgia's father, Alexander VI, died, suddenly Machiavelli starts a sentence by saying, and he told me, and he, Cesare Borgia, told me, etc., etc., and we'll examine what the statement is. But it's very significant, exactly because when you examine the rest of chapter seven, especially in reference to the facts of Senegalia, the killing of uh, Cesare Borgia's enemies in Senegalia in 1502, well, Machiavelli could have used the authority coming out of immersing himself in the story because Machiavelli really was with Cesare Borgia following the facts of Senegalia. So Machiavelli could have been one of the sources, one of the characters in the story being told uh, under what I uh, included here for number three, and he was in with Cesare Borgia when his collaborator Remiro, the Lorqua, was killed, and Machiavelli himself wrote to Florence a powerful description about uh, the body, the corpse of Remiro being found in a piazza, cut in two with a butcher's wedge, the kind of wood, wooden wedge uh, used by butchers to uh, court uh, the uh, the calves to, to split uh, the, the body of the animals that were being butchered, but Machiavelli never mentions himself as being part of this story, which apparently would have added to the authority of his report, but 
he places himself here in between the end of the story of Cesare Borgia and the final examination. So this must mean something. But keep in mind this. Virtue means skills that you can apply to the changing of, situ of, of your si personal situation and the changing of the destiny of your community. But virtue is determined by fortune. Without the, the right set of circumstances, there is no virtue. The skills remain uh, not applied or rather not applicable. And Machiavelli clearly tells you this a couple of times, first at page 53 and then on page 54, after he mentions a series of leaders. This is the next to last paragraph on page 53. He says, if their actions, the actions of their leaders and life are examined, again, he says their actions and life. He doesn't say their qualities, right? Because his idea of virtue is not abstract, it's very pragmatic. If their actions and life are examined, it is not seen that they got anything from fortune other than opportunity, which gave them the material so as to be able to introduce into it whatever form they chose. So, fortune is the material to which skills are applied if your skill are a good match to that kind of context. And without that opportunity, the virtue of their spirit would have been wasted, right? You can be an exceptional individual, but if you're not given the opportunity to succeed, meaning if you're not operating in a context exactly at the time and in the place where your skills are in demand, then you cannot be successful. Without that opportunity, the virtue of their spirit would have been wasted. Without that virtue, the opportunity would have come in vain, right? You have to have this combination between your skills and the critical issues that need to be addressed. And what follows is a very famous paradoxical statement by Machiavelli, the kind of surprising statements that will be repeated even in chapter seven, because it seems to be contrary to what is commonly believed it was therefore necessary for Moses to find the people of Israel in Egypt, enslaved and oppressed by the Egyptians, so that in order to escape servitude, they were disposed to follow him. Where is the necessity of the enslavement of the Jews? The necessity is something that is understood within this context. Moses had the skills for that kind of situation, without, if Moses had been born to uh, a more peaceful period in the history of the Jews, then he would not have been their leader or the right leader for them. That's where the necessity comes from, right? It's not the necessity of slavery, it's the necessity of the game of leadership, right? In the game of leadership, which is played within a certain ecosystem, you become your leader if you have skills to offer that are in demand. Otherwise, tough luck. You, you don't have the opportunity. It means that, uh, um, you, that fortuna, that fortune, has not given you the right opportunities. Page 54, the same concept is repeated beautifully here in the first paragraph. Thus, these opportunities make this man happy, where happiness means being able to make those men able to uh, express, to manifest their leadership. And their own excellent virtue caused the opportunities to be revealed once their fatherlands were ennobled and became very happy. So, the, their communities benefited from this, okay? So keep in mind what we said about leadership and we'll go back to it when we talk about chapter seven.
The other important concepts and a memorable passage uh, can be found in the last paragraph of chapter 6, where Machiavelli talks about prophets that are unarmed, don't rely on force, and makes the example of Girolamo Savonarola, who was a Dominican friar who came to Florence from Ferrara, and in the 1490s, he uh, established a religious movement <coughs> calling people uh, to a return to a more radical interpretation of the Bible, to living a simpler life, to conversion uh, that would be expressed in their uh, daily practices. A lot of people <coughs> followed Savonarola. He enjoyed a large success in his homilies and a political movement was created based on the inspiration provided and the themes provided by Savonarola in his preaching until uh, Savonarola uh, was, uh, well, the, the, the church tried to remove Savonarola because he was having too much success. And of course, his success also endangered uh, the, uh, the, the fate of the Medici family, which around that period was set out of Florence, lost their uh, powers there, and eventually the church had Savonarola tried and convicted of heresy, and Savonarola was burned uh, in Piazza della Signoria. Uh, and, you, you can see paintings in the Florentine museums of this preacher being uh, burned. So what is the message that comes out of this example that you cannot, and it's something that we've discussed before, that you cannot rely just on influence without force. Savonarola, being loyal to his religious inspiration, never wanted to be armed and of course, his influence uh, at some point became limited when he was necessary for him to transition from influence to the use of force. He lacked the means to do so, to defend himself, and that's why he uh, met that uh, terrible death. Okay. Let me know if there are questions if I or, or comment, call if I don't see you, okay? So, something that we know, according to Machiavelli, over and over again, you need to have a balanced reliance on influence and force. In this case, uh, Savonarola was not able to go from relying on influence only to introducing the element of force. The next chapter, will provide under number four here a beautiful example of the transition from the use of force to the use of influence. And in many ways, Cesare Borgia is the opposite of Savonarola, because really, even in the documents of the period, Cesare Borgia was described as a monster and practically as the Antichrist. After all, he was the son of a pope. He was a cardinal. In his youth, his father appointed him a cardinal, and then he didn't want to uh, have a career in the church. He wanted to be a military leader, and his father gave him a dispensation to uh, leave the clergy and become a military leader. And it is clear through most of the chapter that Cesare Borgia relied more easily on force than on influence, and that is part also of his conclusion, where influence was necessary and he failed to apply influence correctly within that particular context. Okay, so chapter seven. It starts with a couple of paragraphs where Machiavelli insists on another concept that is dear to him based on the experience of his times, based on the critical issues that he saw 
within the state of Florence and Italy in general. The number one issue for Italy is Italy during these wars that started with the invasion of Charles VIII in 1494 and were eventually concluded only in 1559, Italy could not resist, uh, could not repel the invasions of France, then Spain, then the empire, Austria, because it was not a unified nation, because it was fragmented politically. So what was to be the solution in Machiavelli's mind? What is being implied in the prince and then stated in the final chapter that someone has to take the leadership of either one Italian state in particular, not really the state of Florence, which was economically strong, but lacked the resources for such a campaign of unification, might have been Venice, for example, but a state or a coalition of Italian states should have started the process of political unification of Italy. And this new state, is exactly the kind of state that Machiavelli mentions in this chapter as well as in others and particularly in the first two paragraphs of this chapter and if you keep in mind that this is one of the pillars of the whole book that this is the very chapter where you find the only leader that is defined as perfect or near perfect you know how important the introduction is why is this kind of leadership necessary because the solution to Italy's problem is to create a new state, but it's not completely new. It is only partially new because it is added to an existing state. So if you imagine the state of Florence being in the leadership for this unification campaign, whatever is added to the state of Florence becoming the Kingdom of Italy is a partially new state, and the same would be true for the state of Venice or for a coalition of states conquering the others, the other states in Italy. So this is a bit <clears throat> dull uh, compared to the rest of the chapter, but is essential to the understanding of the chapter. The second section in this, in this chapter, in chapter seven, describes the plan of Alexander VI. Cesare Borgia's father, who was the Pope and a political leader. Now, keep in mind, don't, don't fall into our uh, 20th and 21st century binary consideration of leadership. Either a leader is pure and completely honest, completely acceptable, or they are to be rejected. When I say that, Alexander VI was a political leader. When I mentioned the fact that he had a Sanchez and a Borgia that he helped uh, with his political connection. In fact, uh, the Pope had four sons and daughters that he had from a married Italian woman, actually an Italian woman that he wanted to be married to someone else so that to reduce the amount of scandal. It doesn't mean, for example, that Alexander VI was not a spiritual pope as well. That he didn't have a spiritual understanding of the religious experience. What, what's hard for us to comprehend is that when you look at leaders from the past, you always find these kinds of contradictions. In the case of, Cesare, of Alexander VI, the apparent contradictions are uh, he was a political leader, not just a spiritual leader. Well. The church was a political state. The church had a territory in central Italy that uh, uh, the church controlled m more or less, often indirectly. That is to say, a lot of those areas in central and northern Italy, uh, as north as, as the area south of the Po, po River in, in northern Italy, not too far uh, from Venice, were independent in regards to the administration of local matters, but they, they were subject to the authority of the Pope when it came to international politics, foreign affairs, 
And of course, they had to send money to Rome. They had to provide soldiers if necessary for the wars of the Pope. And it is true that Alexander VI became Pope by bribing some of the cardinals who voted for him and promising uh, important administrative positions that would be financially rewarding to some of those cardinals. At the same time, those cardinals would not have elected someone who was a complete hypocrite, that had no understanding whatsoever of the spiritual side of the church. And that is, this is reflected in the documents, in the religious documents that Alexander VI produced as the Pope, which are, are, are not the uh, devil's incarnate uh, uh, outcome, uh, but uh, demonstrate a deeper understanding even of, of spiritual matters. So it's just a kind of contradictions that you find in plenty of examples of leaders. So after the introduction, Machiavelli discusses the options that Alexander VI had in terms of the expansion of the power of the church to get to the point where Cesare Borgia becomes the protagonist, becomes the agent entrusted by his father for the realization of this plan of expansion. And the plan uh, is based on two things. On, on one hand of, 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 of this political spectrum, both Alexander and his son Cesare need the support of some international powers and their choice is France. They choose to rely on the power of the French nation to shield them from the consequences of their campaigns of expansion. On the other hand, they see the possibility of uh, acquiring a, a more solid control of an area, which is the area on the Adriatic Sea south of Venice, that was strategically important because it was kind of central within an area where if you moved northwest, you, you could attack the Duchy of Milan, which was kind of weak during this period. And in fact, it fell, as Machiavelli mentions in chapter three, it fell twice between the 1490s and the 1500s. If you move northeast, you could attack Venice or take territories out of Venice. Of course, Venice being one of the most formidable players in the Italian political context during that time. If you moved southwest, you could attack Florence, which was stronger than Milan, but weaker than Venice, and was flush with cash. That is to say, if you manage to conquer Florence, then you would have a lot of financial resources. Florence was sitting on a lot of cash, a lot of gold Florence. And therefore, if you manage to eliminate Florence, then not only you've eliminated one of the key players in this political game for unification, but you replenish your coffers with plenty of money that you can use to pay for soldiers because soldiers during this period are mostly mercenaries and therefore you need a lot of cash to pay for their salaries. Now, what is significant in this second section where the Pope contemplates the option and then decides to use Cesare Borgia to attack that cluster of city-states which are formally under the state of the church but really they're not controlled by the church and therefore, if the church replaces those local leaders with their immediate direct control, then they have control of a very strategic area from which they can mount a campaign against some of the other key players. What's significant about this passage is the style. Because traditionally, the methodology used, relied upon by historians or anyone narrating history from the classical historians of the Greek and Roman periods to the Middle Ages had been the principle of autopsy, which has nothing to do with CSI. Uh, autopsy here is not the dissection of corpses to 
ascertain the causes of their murder. Autopsy is based on the etymology of this word in, in Greek, to see with your own eyes. That is to say, if you tell a story, and that story is fact, historical, how do you establish your authority with the reader? Why should the readers believe what you are telling them, right? These days, uh, the, the foundation of modern historiography is mostly documents, right? This is the evidence of what I'm telling. It can be material evidence, it can be documentary evidence, it could be primary, secondary sources, etc. During the period from 500 BC to practically 1500 uh, AD, the principle of autopsy is established based on the assumption that what the historian is telling you, the readers, is, ba is based on the testimony on the report of an eyewitness or multiple eyewitnesses, okay? So that's why, for example, when you read the Gospels, for example, take the Gospel of St. John, right away from the very first pages, what is being told to you is the story of the encounter between Jesus and the first of the apostles. Because the implication is everything that you will read inside this gospel is based on the direct experience of the apostles who were with Jesus throughout his life. And therefore, this, this, this gospel has credibility because even though it is not uh, the same well, for, for some of the uh, Gospels, not the same people who were there, there is a transmission of reports, right? The Gospel of John allegedly is written by one of the Apostles, even though it was actually written after the death of John himself. After Paul's epistles, too. Yes, that too. And other Gospels, such as the Gospel of Luke, were written by someone who knows someone who knew Jesus at some point. This is why in traditional histories, such as the books of history written by the Roman historians, one of the typical devices for the narrative is the moment when an important political character delivers a speech. Why the inclusion of so many speeches in traditional history books? Because otherwise it would be impossible to legitimate the use of the plans, the thoughts, the ideas of the leaders. The historian could not simply say, this is what Julius Caesar thought, and this is why he did what he did. Because what would be the foundation for that? Where is the evidence? Now, the evidence based on the principle of autopsy is, if I frame my description of the mind of Julius Caesar by providing on the page's speech, then the assumption is Julius Caesar spoke to some people, could be his collaborators, it could be the people of Rome, and therefore someone was there. And if the historian himself was not there, then the historian allegedly knows somebody who knows somebody who knew somebody who was there, okay? Machiavelli does nothing of this sort, to the point where even though he was present to some of the events from this chapter, he fails to insert himself as an eyewitness to the events. And instead of relying to, for, on, on autopsy, Machiavelli simply directly states Alexander VI had these options, Alexander VI saw these things, Alexander VI decided to do these things. He replaces the principle of autopsy with a principle we can call consistency narrative consistency. That is to say, Machiavelli starts with an assumption, tries to put himself 
in the shoes of the Pope and examines what options the Pope would have seen, how the situation could be read by the Pope, and the confirmation of the hypothesis, uh, whether or not the hypothesis is credible, is provided by the fact. That is to say, if we assume that this was the mindset of the Pope, are the Pope's decision consistent with our assumption? If we find that kind of consistency, then our speculation is confirmed by factual evidence, right? So we move from the fact to trying to reconstruct the mindset of a leader. And he does that both with Alexander VI and with Cesare Borgia, without trying to say there was someone who can confirm that this is what the Pope, this is what the Pope's son thought during those periods, Christine. Is it a kind of transition from almost journalism reporting sort of writing to, I don't know, something resembling writing a novel in a way? It is influenced by the transition of literature from medieval literature, with, which relied a lot on autopsy. So the typical medieval story is a story where you can only see what the characters said or did. So there is an external point of view which is true, for example, even for the short story of the knight and the snake. We ne were never taken into the mind or the heart of this knight. We only see the scene from, from outside. Everything is narrated as if the writer and the reader had the point of view of someone who was observing the scene. So in the case of the story of uh, the knight um, and, and the snake, we see what the knight does going out of the house, what the women do, what happens in the room uh, with the baby, but always from the outside. There is no attempt to reconstruct their inner worlds. And from Boccaccio on, and, and this is true for, for the novella of Ciappelletto that we read, we have a lot of the exploration of the inner worlds of the characters. And in fact, we have this interplay between the point of view of the writer, which is the point of view of God. Uh, the writer has this omniscience, this knowledge of everything, Third right? Person. Assumes an external point of view, which is, however, a point of view that goes inside, that uh, goes into the invisible things, into the things that are not done directly by the characters or set, stated directly by the characters to explain what happens. And this is contrasted with what others in the story can see. So sometimes there are secondary characters in the story that cannot understand what the primary characters are doing, why they're doing so. For example, Ciappelletto is in the house of these two brothers and offers to save them and their business, basically. And the two brothers cannot fathom why he's doing that, right? Because their point of view is limited and we, share the point of view of, of the writer, which can see everything the same way that the god of the Middle Ages could see everything outside and inside. So it is the continuation of literature applied to the narration of history. And then during the 1500s, historiography will actually transition through uh, to the use of documents. Not only documents were being used even earlier, but not only are documents being used, they're even footnoted. The sources are clearly identified. But at this point, it's more like we know the facts, what preceded those facts. So we can speculate what the plan was and then use the facts as confirmation that the plan we imagined Alexander VI had uh, was. The facts confirm that our assumption about the mind of the Pope or the mind of Cesare Borgia were correct. Because there is this consistency between our description of the mind of these leaders, which is our invention, and the facts that are confirmed by historical evidence. Okay. Number three, I'm, I'm trying, of course, I, I, I don't have uh, a lot of time, but um, let me go through one or two points. Number three, is the section 
where Machiavelli talks first about how Cesare Borgia got to control the mercenary units of the minor aristocracy in the state of the church, the Orsini and other families controlled castles outside of Rome, in the hills of the region of Lazio around Rome. They, their communities relied mostly economically on the money that was coming in from the military services they provided to the Pope himself or to other states. And uh, of course, when you uh, mount a military campaign and you rely on mercenary soldiers, then they're more difficult to control, right? Uh, because they can always enter into a kind of bargain or negotiation, either you give me more money or we go and work for your enemies, <clears throat> okay? That's plain and simple. And how do you control mercenaries? You would have to rely on other mercenaries, but if they know that they have to be engaged in a bloody battle, then they will want more money themselves. So it's a difficult situation. So the first part of the third section is how Cesare Borgia got to, to manage those difficult uh, aristocrats and their paid soldiers, and then the facts of Senegalia. In Senegalia in 1502, Cesare Borgia, who had already uh, invaded this area at the borders of the state of the church and managed to acquire control of a small territory, he was still engaged in battles with other city-states in that area. He promised that he would negotiate a peace agreement, invited his enemies into the city of Senegalia to discuss the terms of this peace agreement, and after the representatives, the leaders of these city-states entered the city of Senegalia, the gates of the town were closed, these leaders were captured or chased in the streets of the city until they were captured and then they were killed. So by using subterfuge, by using manipulation and deceit, Cesare Borgia got rid of his enemy and saved resources on what would have been a long and costly military campaign. Because after the elimination of these leaders, the city-states that they controlled became part of the area controlled directly by Cesare Borgia, and Cesare Borgia installed his own uh, governors in those places. What is the most striking aspect of this story, which is, of course, the use of deceit and direct use of force, right? Because you have enemies that are being murdered, not killed in battle, but murdered because they came with a limited escort, right? So they would be easily overpowered by Cesare Borgia in Senegalia. The most striking uh, statement is the one that you find about the simplicity of the victims. So Machiavelli telling something that was scandalous during this time, that supported the idea that Cesare Borgia was the Antichrist, was a monster, was a cruel, evil individual, instead of entering into the ethical discussion of what Cesare Borgia did and whether or not it is legitimate for a leader, blames the victims and say, well, the victims were stupid. They should not have gone to Senegalia. They should not have placed themselves in that kind of situation. And this is where I will stop and uh, continue. Perhaps I'll just conclude this on Wednesday instead of waiting until next week. On Wednesday, as I said, I will also be discussing the template for the paper and the suggestions you find in a page devoted to that on the class weekly.